Andre, inflation is a wonderful theory that helps us understand the beginnings of the universe, but one aspect of it seems either mistaken or counterintuitive. We know for sure that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And on the other hand, you tell us in this small billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, the universe expanded, who knows, 10 to the billionth time or something. It sounds like it's contradictory. How could it go faster than the speed of light? Well, uh, yeah, indeed, it looks like well, an example of cheating, uh, which we are doing on scientific ground. Uh, what is the true answer is that um, this constraint that nothing can be faster than the speed of light is the Einstein rule for the speed of the signal. Okay, So just imagine that you have your universe and you decided to send a wave in it. Mm -hmm. okay? Nothing can be propagating faster than the speed of light, mm -hmm. so this wave moved with the speed of light and that's the best it can do. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, just imagine our universe like a, well, big elastic membrane. Put one nail into one part of the membrane, another nail in another uh, um, part of the membrane, and the nails just do not move at all. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. But then expansion of the universe means that these elastic membranes are stretching. Mm -hmm. And there is no bound on the speed with which the membrane is stretching. It is not even the property of only inflation. If you look at the present expansion of our universe, all objects which are right now further away from us than the speed of light multiplied by the age of the universe approximately, all of them are moving away from us with a speed greater than speed of light. And just we were not particularly emphasizing it in our textbooks, but this is a fact. And so in inflation, it's just more efficient. Inflation is a very, very rapid stretching of space. And during this stretching, if you take even a very minuscule part of space during a very short period of time, it stretches at an enormous length and the universe becomes large without violating the constraint which Einstein have invented. A and there is no limit to that speed of which the, the space itself can expand? No, the there is no limit to this speed. Of it's course, again, yeah. you can think that, you know, who knows, we did not check it. Maybe there is some element of cheating still involved in it. Uh, like, suppose y I, I'm telling you uh, that according to inflationary theory, all our galaxies have been produced by quantum fluctuations. And then you will ask me, but did you really see quantum fluctuations? And well, yeah, no, uh, I can show it to you. Like, for example, here I have, well, Two toothpicks, yeah, okay? Yeah. So they're normal toothpicks. And what you are going to see right now explains you a concept of this quantum fluctuation. So take them two, and they just cannot move, right? But you see they jump. That's because I asked them jump. And this is an example of quantum fluctuations. And surely there is no cheating <laughs> involved. You just see that it happens on your own eyes, right? So that's what we are Did doing you go in to cosmology. A magician school? No, I am not going to magician school. This is my mother. She explained it to me when I was much, much younger than I am now. Okay, my mother didn't explain me about the universe. This trick it was necessary to do myself. <laughs> so how then does, does quantum theory uh, interact with inflation theory in terms of the meaning of the expansion of the universe? The thing is this, um, and that is really important, but this is hard. Okay, uh, you know that inflation is based on this theory of scale of field. And a scale of field is what? And a, sc and a scale of field is, well, I'm now explaining <laughs> it. Okay, yes. Okay, a scale of field is some field which has uh, uh, potential and kinetic energy if it moves, but if it does not, it looks like a vacuum state, etc. So the main idea of Alan Booth was to use this scale of field um, as a source of energy which expands the universe, but the scale of field in his scenario did not move. Now, in new inflation and in chaotic inflation, scale of field was moving. And this motion, actually, this was something which was breaking Lorentz invariance of the expanding universe and created the meaning to expansion. Because if you have this empty vacuum, really just heavy vacuum expanding, 
and nothing is moving there, then you can change your coordinate system and you will see no expansion there. So this expansion in the false vacuum is false expansion. What happened, why new inflation and chaotic inflation solved the problem of Alan Goose scenario is that you took his model and changed the most important part. Instead of sitting in the false vacuum, you start moving and this motion violates invariance of the vacuum state. This motion makes everything depending on the coordinate system. This motion allows you to define clock in the universe. And as a result of that, when you really study the amplitude of quantum fluctuations in the universe, the answer, which was, well, given by uh, um, several different people, starting from Slava Mukhanov, etc., the answer contains the velocity of the scale field in the denominator. Okay? So if the scale field does not move, you have very large perturbations and inflationary theory doesn't work. Only if scale field moves, then you have finite answer for the amplitude of small density perturbations which later are responsible for galaxies. But if it moves too fast, then there is no inflation. So inflation is somewhere between the normal regime where everything moves too fast yes. and abnormal regime where everything does not move. What Alan Guth did, he started with this abnormal regime and there was an illusion of exponentially rapid expansion but this was expansion which, well, you could not characterize invariantly what expands because it's empty thing. If something starts moving slowly, you have an invariant characterization of the speed of expansion and you can produce perturbations of density which later give rise to galaxies. But then for this you need to have this tiny, tiny motion. S so inflation to work has to be within very tight bounds of, of, of motion, but not too fast? Yes, you know, this resembles me this story, which, uh, well, one of the people who um, uh, well, worked together with Enrico Fermi um, not, well, was uh, telling us. Enrico Fermi was a famous physicist, yeah, sure. and he was like his biographer. So once they were near the sea and they start swimming and so Enrico Fermi swims and this guy swims after him and ask Enrico, tell me, what is the secret of your genius? And he tells him, well, you know, the most important thing is to take the, uh, well, the simplest part of the effect to concentrate on it, to simplify it a little bit, and then you see everything clearly. And then he continue swimming, and his well, <laughs> friend swims after him, and then he asks, uh, yes, Enrico, but what else? And Enrico tells him, but you should not oversimplify, because if you oversimplify, then you just, well, you get wrong results. And then this guy uh, asks him, so, but how I distinguish okay. what is oversimplify <laughs> and what is just simplify? And Enrico answers him, well, for this, you must be a genius like me. <laughs> so in this uh, case, in the case of inflation, it is a tiny, well, medium ground. If a uh, scale of field does not change at all, then it is inflation in the false vacuum which is not productive, it is not completely useful. It is useful a little, but if you end with this, you do not produce the universe like ours. Mm. If you have too fast motion, this inflation does not work at all. Mm. And if you have just in the middle, and you know where the middle is, mm. then you're doing great.